to put it simply, um, the judge here has found that, um, that the three actions that were brought by Ben Robert Smith against the age, the Sydney Morning Herald and the Canberra Times and also the journalists, um, uh, that, 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 that those actions have been dismissed. And that's on the basis that the, um, the defendants have been able to prove the truth of most of the imputations that were pleaded by, uh, by Ben Robert Smith in his statement of claim. Uh, and those that he couldn't prove to be true were uh, defended by, uh, sorry, th those that the media couldn't prove to be true uh, have been defended by a different defence which is called contextual truth and it's a bit of a tricky complex defence but um, but essentially it means that the allegations that could be proven to be true were so harmful and so damaging to Ben Robert Smith's reputation that those that couldn't be proven to be true uh, didn't really further affect his reputation at all. Okay so is this a win, this is a win for the newspapers then and a loss for Ben Robert Smith? Absolutely, yes, it's, and, and, and it was un, I, I, from my perspective, it was unexpected. I, I thought mm -hmm. the, that Ben Robert Smith would win on some things, and the yeah. media would win on others, and it'd be a bit of a mixed bag. But this is uh, this is um, definitely come down firmly on on the side of the media here. Right. So, what did the judge have to weigh up? Well, the judge had to determine whether or not the, the imputations that have been pleaded and have been found to have been conveyed by the, the various uh, publications had, uh, had in fact been um, proven to be true uh, by the evidence presented by the defence, the, def the media defendants in this case. And, um, and, and indeed, that's what he found. And, uh, and it's, it's um, I suppose, a real vindication for this, um, this type of journalism. I mean, uh, this is on a, a matter of extreme public importance. There were grave allegations. Uh, I really thought the media would have a, a, a real, a real battle to to be able to establish the truth of these uh, these allegations, particularly because they involved allegations of criminality, and they're always particularly difficult to prove true um, in court in a civil context. Mm. Um, so, look, it really is um, it really is unexpected to some degree. It's fantastic. The case cost. A fortune, what, oh. 25 million, 35 million dollars? Who that's, has to that's what they're estimating. pay that? Well, there will be a cost decision um, made by uh, Justice Bazanko at some point. Um, we heard there that um, from Nick Owens, who, or Nicholas Owens, who's, who is the barrister for the, um, the media defendants, uh, that they're seeking indemnity costs, which really mean that, um, that the costs will be uh, very close to what the real costs were. So um, so rather than seeking it on a, a scale basis, um, indemnity costs have been sought. So mm. the media may get back, I would predict, if, if indemnity costs are awarded, probably between 80 to 90 per cent of their costs, hopefully. OK, so what does this mean for, for Ben Robert Smith? Well, that's a good question. I mean, we now have a judgment of the federal court uh, finding that um, on a balance of probabilities, Ben Robert Smith um, did commit um, some of the things that he's alleged to have committed in those articles. And it really leaves open the possibility that uh, there may be further action taken against him. I would have thought I'm not a military uh, justice lawyer. I, I, that's not my area of expertise, but mm. it would seem um, very odd if that was just left hanging there. Of course, there's always the possibility that Ben Robert Smith will appeal. And we heard from um, his barrister, Arthur Moses, uh, just then um, that uh, they were seeking an extension of the time within which to bring uh, an application for an appeal. So it may very well be that we're having to, we'll be back here in, you know, 18 months time discussing the same things. Yeah. So looking back then, what were the, the key moments uh, of this trial for you, Jason? Well, I mean, look, it, it was an extremely lengthy trial. It had so many witnesses. It was the fact that a lot of the witnesses were um, were um, protected by pseudonym orders, so we don't actually know their identities. We know that some of them were uh, colleagues of Ben Robert Smith, um, who served with him as part of the SAS, uh, and uh, they gave their evidence in court without their identities being disclosed, and that's, that's unusual in a defamation case, um, really. And to have so many witnesses um, uh, uh, being protected by pseudonym orders. There are also the national security issues, which are, you know, extremely significant in this case. Um, and then just the, um, the, the sheer number of hearing days. We had COVID. I mean, it was, it was, it was a lot. And I would say um, that there have been other big defamation cases, but I think in, in recent times, this has to be the biggest. Um, it's probably the most expensive. Um, and, and it's, you know, and it, it also, I suppose, more broadly makes you think about, you know, whether or not bringing defamation claims is, you know, necessarily a good idea. I mean, I, I only vaguely knew of Ben Robert Smith prior to this uh, this case. I mean, I, 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 if, if someone had sort of pointed out, you know, um, something about him, I might have recalled it. But now, you know, Ben Robert Smith's name 
is, you know, firmly embedded in my mind and, you know, in, in association with these allegations. So it just, it really makes you sort of sit back and think about the, the function of defamation law and, and whether it's really worth um, bringing proceedings to vindicate reputation and the risks that are involved in that, yes. I think. This uh, case then will have an impact on the whole legal system, will it? Because mm. um, the case was brought before changes to defamation mm. laws mm. happened, is that right? That is right. Look, I don't think that those changes would have affected this case right. really much at all. Um, there is now a new public interest defence in the in the um, in the, de the defamation law across mm. Australia. Um, I don't, I don't, I'm not confident that the media would have attempted to rely upon that. To be honest, I think they um, that would have involved um, a lot of the same things that would have been involved in bringing. Um, a public interest defence under the, the previous law. There was a similar public interest defence under the previous law and, and it's now been changed a bit. I don't think that, 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 that the change that occurred in 2021 would have altered the, the media's stance on that. I think they would have gone down the same path of, of relying upon truth. So this is the judge's summary that we've uh, just heard. His reasons are to be published and mm. we were told that they're going to be pretty long. What will you be keen to, to read in that? Look, I really want to see how the contextual truth defence work. I, I, I know that um, I, I, I sort of skated over that issue earlier and it's a complex legal issue. So for me, that'll be the interesting thing. Um, also, just the, 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 the evidence that was relied upon to convince um, the judge here that, uh, that Ben Robert Smith had indeed engaged in the conduct that was alleged. I mean, I think that um, they were such serious allegations and ordinarily, um, when allegations of criminality or serious misconduct are made, the standard of proof is the same, but the burden to get there is m more difficult. Mm. Um, so, look, there had to be some really significant evidence um, in order to to make out the the truth of those um, the truth of those allegations. So, I'll be really interested to read uh, to read what that evidence was and how how the judge addressed it. And there are credibility issues as well that I think the judge had to had to consider. Legally speaking, this case isn't a particularly complex one. It's all in the in the evidence and the and the detail around um, around uh, you know things like um, uh, who who did what and you know he said against you know he, he said mm. something else and he, so it, it's contradictory evidence and I think that that was really the difficulty in this case. It was the evidence. It wasn't so much the law. Okay, and the Commonwealth a couple of hours ago intervened to try to delay the release of the, the full judgment and we were hearing now arguments from Ben Robert Smith's lawyer. What was he saying? Well, there are two judgments that the judge had prepared. One was an open, what's called an open judgment, which is will be made available, um, would, well, it would ordinarily be made available immediately after the trial, uh, immediately after the judgment being handed down, I should say. Um, and then he also prepared a closed judgment, which contained material which was protected under national security law. Uh, and that, that, that judgment would not be published to the public, um, but it would be provided to, to limited people. What has been sought is a, a delay in the publication of the open judgment just so that the Commonwealth can go through it to make a determination as to whether or not there's anything in there that might inadvertently um, disclose national security information. And so that's, uh, that, 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 that's what's been applied for. And indeed, uh, that was granted by Justice Bazanko. So he granted what is known as a suppression order yeah. uh, over the publication of that judgment. Um, so look, what's contained within the open judgment, I don't know whether or not there is national security information in there. Um, I'm not sure, but that's certainly what the Commonwealth is concerned about. How unusual, Jason, is it to, to have a ruling like this in a defamation case broadcast? Oh, it's 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 fairly unusual. Um, uh, to, you know, it, it's only really highly um, uh, 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 cases of um, public interest where you would have uh, this type of thing happen. It sometimes occurs in in uh, in in the criminal courts where you have a you know a defendant who is uh, committed a notorious crime, and and there might be a, a, the sentencing might be broadcast. Uh, but for defamation cases, it's fairly unusual, and so mm. um, uh, it just goes to really the the um, the significance of the findings, I think, in this case. 
Um, and also the significance of this case for public interest journalism. I think um, it's a good day for public interest journalism. Uh, you know, it's really vindicating um, the importance that we place in, uh, in in this type of reporting to uncover these types of um, this, these types of conduct and 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 to really um, shine a light on yeah. on on misconduct. So I, I think it's a, a great day mm. for public interest journalism. Yeah, and you said you were surprised by the the outcome. Is that partly because um, defamation cases tend to favour the plaintiff mm. because the burden of proof of truth um, lies with the defendant and it's hard to prove. Yes, and particularly truth. I mean, truth yeah, for the media uh, is, is um, often they know what they're publishing is true, but they don't have the evidence that's needed in court, so admissible evidence uh, that's required to prove the truth of it, particularly in relation to things like criminality and serious allegations of misconduct. Mm -hmm. So um, I really thought that it, they would be hard pressed to do that, given that the burden rested entirely upon them. Uh, but they've managed to do it. And I think that that's, um, that's a real testament to the, the both, both the reporting, but also the legal work in this case. I mean, um, it, it's just been an extraordinary undertaking for the lawyers and the barristers representing the media to um, to argue this case, and and uh, it's uh, from that perspective for me, it was an unexpected mm. outcome. I just didn't think um, that they would be able to. And, and if there was the evidence, I just didn't think. I thought that Ben Robert Smith might settle, or there might be. But to actually take it all the way to trial, where the stakes were so high, yeah. I really just thought that it would be it would be difficult for the media to do. But they've done it. So, <laughs> and the stakes, as you say, they were so high for the media if they'd lost. <sighs> Oh, exactly. I mean, the costs, implications and um, and those types of things. I mean, it's just extraordinary. So and this case has attracted uh, international attention uh, for the sheer scale of it, I guess. Oh, absolutely. So so in terms of I mean, it's not just the it's not just the sitting days and the number of witnesses and all those types of things. It's the fact that it related to such um, public interest uh, matters. It related to, you know, the war, uh, the, you know, um, military misconduct uh, and those types of things. And of course, that, that's of not only national interest, but, but global interest.